All right, so I'm here with evangelist Randy Keener. Brother Keener is out of New Manor Baptist Church. That's in Marion, North Carolina. That's correct. And uh, that's where Tony Shirley is the pastor. Yes, sir. And um, Brother Keener is, uh, he's an evangelist. What do you love about being an evangelist? Oh, man. <laughs> out of all the questions you could have asked me, evangelism. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, really just um, being able to go and fulfill what I believe my calling is. Amen. Um, that, for me, is the peak uh, of what I'm doing. Yeah. Because um, uh, as much as uh, guys like Andrew Sluter have joked about it, I'm not full-time yeah. uh, in, in evangelism in the sense that I'm traveling every week somewhere different. I usually go about a week and a week and a month. Okay. And that's because of responsibilities at home and whatnot. Right. But uh, I am appreciative of that week and weekend that I can fulfill that calling. Right. What um what are some of your favorite experiences as an evangelist? Thing that I love most about traveling around, and nobody would be able to tell this, but is going and eating at the different places in the different towns. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a super honest. It is. Answer. It is. But where I'm from, <laughs> if you spend time in Asheville, yeah. It's a super food city. Okay. Like there's all kinds of if you're a foodie, that is a cool place to go cuz they just got so many different things. Yeah. I guess it's ingrained in me from culturally being there. But being able to travel and, and try the local things. I'm not a fan of big box restaurants. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to go to the Outback, Red Lobster. I want to try the local place. You're the first evangelist or first preacher that admitted that. <laughs> but the, the funny thing That's is, it. I love that as well. I don't know if I would have said that that was my favorite thing, but it's definitely one of my favorite things. When mm -hmm. I go to different countries or different uh, different places in the U.S., I want to try. What's the what's the thing here? Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, though, it's gotten me in trouble for it. The sickest that I've ever been as a result of this was in Mexico. Oh, really? Um, I mentioned Andrew a moment ago. He and I had some bad tacos. Oh, no. Street tacos. Okay. Yeah, bought them, and this looks like a, a tin can on the side of the road. Yeah. And I forgot what it was, but anyway... Nobody else got any. I mean, they didn't stand a chance. Andrew and I had the meat gone. It was devoured. Uh -oh. But he got sick, and to be as sensitive to your viewers as possible, he was projectile vomiting in the street that night. <laughs> oh, wow. It was bad, man. Oh, man. The problem with me, though, is I didn't throw up. So all of that stayed inside. Oh, no. The next day when I woke up, Caleb Hickam, I don't know if you know Caleb Hickam. I know of him. Okay. Yeah. He was with us on this trip. That next morning, I was literally hallucinating. <laughs> they came in my room and they were saying, hey, we got to go. We got to get to this other town. Andrew was so sick, he couldn't travel. Okay. And we had an hour to get back to him. And when they came and got me, um, one of the preachers there, I was trying to speak to him. I thought I was speaking Spanish. Yeah. And so I was just kind of mumbling in my head. I, I knew what I was saying and I'm speaking to him in Spanish <laughs> and uh, he goes to get his wife because she spoke English. Yeah. He thought I was speaking English. He goes and gets her and she goes like, she's like, he's not speaking English either. I, I, we don't know what he's saying, right. but uh, thank the Lord. It didn't last that long. <laughs> um. You know, uh, Mexicans, man, they, they take advantage of every part of the animal. And mm -hmm. so, uh, one preacher friend of mine took me, he said, you ever had eyeball tacos? Mm -hmm. uh, tacos de ojito oh, we, is what they're them. called. And I, now I'm the kind, I'll try anything. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Yeah. I think it's my second favorite kind of taco. You yeah. know what I didn't like was um, cheek. You know what? I was about to say, that's my first favorite kind of taco. Really? Ooh. You didn't like it? No. I, I loved the there cheek. There was something about it that I did not like. But it's extremely rare for me to find something I don't like. You'll try anything. I will try how about, just about anything. How about the tongue? Uh, yeah, I've had, I've okay. had tongue. Yeah, yeah, that's real that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't know if I ate anything in Mexico that I didn't like. That's, that's my favorite. The only food that I just, it's an absolute no for me, is bananas. 
You don't like bananas? I don't like bananas. You wouldn't all. like Puerto Rico then. Okay. We love bananas in Puerto I, Rico. I do not. But I bet if you tried bananas in Puerto Rico, you would like it. So that's what they told me in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And they were wrong. <laughs> okay. But you know, they got the little, they're yeah. not actually bananas. I don't think they're plantains. Well, yeah, th there's that. Okay. But in Puerto Rico, there's different kinds. As a matter of fact, we have a banana that they're real small. They taste like apple. Really? It's a consistency of a banana. Does it smell like a banana? It smells like a banana. Well, the smell really gets to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I I would try it. I would at least try Those it. Those are my favorite. They, they taste just like apple flavor, but a, in a shape and form of a banana. Probably the only food that I've tried other than bananas that I just didn't like, um, that I went into wondering if I would, Baloo. Baloo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did not like Baloo. Yeah. But I had a cheering room of Filipinos, so I had to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's one of I love those. Filipino it was food. an honor thing, you know. Yeah, sure, so. sure. Okay, well that that took us in a direction I did not expect. I was expecting a spiritual answer. Oh, sorry. And brother Rand Randy is the first. <laughs> he's the first preacher that actually gave an honest answer. But we, we get on the topic of food. We'll be here. That'll be the whole oh, interview. I, yeah, we, I could literally <laughs> talk about it all night long. Uh, well, uh, what about some crazy experiences as an evangelist? What's some wild stuff you've experienced as an evangelist? So a, a few of the things that uh, I'm trying to sift through some things because there's also some people, you know, I wouldn't want to hurt their feelings. Right. You know what I'm saying? I understand. Um, yeah. So uh, let me take you to some of, of my street evangelism stuff um, because me personally, my perception of evangelism isn't as much the itinerant church to church preaching sure as it is doing the the personal work on the streets street preaching that's biblical uh, evangelism. Yeah, exactly right and so some of the things that i experienced there one night uh we had a lady we gave her a gospel track and she was so furious she ate the track <laughs> she tore it up she ate it, swallowed it, and, and she's like, that's what I think of what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, she's just going on tangent, and she's like, I, I can't stand Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was like, ma'am, I'm Baptist. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to act like that in that case. And I think, like, she's just normal now. Like, you literally just ate that gospel track. Like, there was nothing normal that just happened. So yeah, that's like high ranking. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've, I've, that's not the first time I've heard of. I've never seen it in all my time doing street evangelism. But I've heard of uh, my former pastor, Brother Baker, tells a story about passing out tracks to people in the prison, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing. He said someone took the track and just stuffed it <laughs> right in his <laughs> right in his mouth. Sometimes people are, are hungry. I guess <laughs> there was a fella downtown Asheville. I used to preach in this spot called Pritchard Park. Mm -hmm. Pritchard Park, it, it's an old park. It's named after this Pritchard individual. But anyway, I, I'm preaching there, and this guy walks up, and, and we actually kind of struck up a friendship just from my time in going there. But he had long, shaggy hair, had a, a long purple cape that he'd wear, had a bongo drum that he kept under the cape, and he'd smoke cigarettes and stuff, had a big old staff, and it, it had all these names of God carved into this staff, had like this big old crystal on top. And he just wow. walked, he called himself the prophet. Okay. And what's funny is the grasp on dispensationalism this man had, even though it was very messed up, yeah. he, he is speaking to me one day and he says, my brother, you're called to preach the gospel of the grace of God, whereas I'm here to announce the coming kingdom of God. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And I was like, well, that's that's interesting. You would know that. Okay. But anyway, I'm preaching in Pritchard Park. And while I'm preaching, this group of lesbians comes by. It's like all of these um, very masculine acting women. Okay. Okay. And, and it was a big group. And there they stop. They hear what I'm saying. You know, I'm not calling them out for stuff and yelling at them. You know how some right, guys right. will do. I'm just preaching, sure. you know, just giving the gospel. Amen. But they're cussing, they're yelling, they're screaming. They're like coming and starting to get in my face. Oh, and boy. 
out of nowhere, the prophet shows up. <laughs> to, and to he, rescue he, to re Yes. <laughs> he steps between me and them. And he had just such a smooth voice. He says, do you know the name of this park? And one says, yeah, it's Pritchard Park. He says, where that came from is Preacher's Park. Wow. That's not correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's not accurate. He says, it comes from Preacher's Park. And so he's just doing what the park was traditionally meant for. And, and kind of like the first lady I was talking about, I was like a, a, a switch flipped. And they're like, oh, OK, well, that makes sense then. And they just all leave. And, and that was the end of it. So the, the prophet rescued me. That was a good prophet. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe he's one of the witnesses. Like, he's probably going to have to get off those cigarettes. Yeah. yeah, he might need to do that. Yeah, that'll help him out. Um, what are some uh, hardships in the life of an evangelist that you deal with? So I, I'll stay on this end of my traveling and whatnot. Um, I'm extremely blessed. I've got a very good job. Um, I, I'm in financial services. And so that allows me to schedule time off to do what I do. That's why I was able to be here this week. And there's a lot of churches that I'm able to go to that I'm not saying other guys wouldn't, but it would present hardship. I was at a church earlier this year and the church, I'm not complaining if they ever watch it. God knows I'm not complaining, mm -hmm. but it's a very small church, very small congregation. Sure. And, uh, you know, I go out there, we're having small meals, you know, every, every time service is over and they cut me a check for, it was like $250 at the end of the week because I have my job didn't even matter. matter. As a matter of fact, if they gave me nothing, it, it wouldn't have even mattered. And I would be truly grateful for the opportunity to go. Amen. Whereas a lot of other brothers who, who are in evangelism on the full-time scale of things, it would be very trying sure. to go to a meeting and do that. So, you know, that's the only thing that had caused me a little bit of difficulty in the past because you know what it's like as a missionary going around. Um, it's not about the money, but if you don't have the money, you don't feed your family, you, you don't pay your bills. And so you need all of, all of the financing to make it work. Right. For me, on the other side, before I pastored, I'd travel around and preach some. That was the the biggest piece of it was just being able to take off of work. I, I was working an hourly job and they were good with me. They'd right. let me take off and go preach. But if I missed work and didn't get paid, well, then I was in trouble because mm -hmm. um, I, I had bills. And at that point, I was living <clears throat> paycheck to paycheck. So I'll just say that that was the hardest part then. As far as now, um, I don't want to make it sound too simple, but really, I mean, the Lord's just blessed me at the point where yeah. I get to show up, preach. I don't have to even think about anything financial. And I encourage uh, a lot of these pastors when I go into smaller churches, listen, don't worry about that. If yeah. whatever you give me, that that's between you and the Lord, but that is not what this is about. Mm -hmm. And if you can't give anything, don't worry about it. No. So that's what I love about doing these interviews. I, I love hearing the different stories of, of the different preachers and different folks that are serving the Lord uh, in, in the different ministries God's called them to. Mm -hmm. And everyone has a different situation. Yeah. And it's just um, it, it's enjoyable to hear <clears throat> how the Lord uh, sustains all of us in, in, yes. in his own way. And so praise the Lord. Now, let's shift gears here a little bit. You have a degree mm -hmm. from Institute for Creation Research. Now that's interesting to me. That's uh, I mean, so you uh, sort of specialize with that degree in apologetics and yes, that's what the the degree is. It's in um, applied apologetics, mm -hmm. and that's why I went to ICR. Uh, they're they're not where I'm at on a lot of issues. Sure, you know, in, in particular the King James Bible, right. But the reason that I wanted to study there wasn't necessarily even for the Bible education. It was for the apologetics, the science, the things that they're doing of that nature. And so 
uh, I was extremely blessed in having that opportunity, and I'm actually in their master's program right now. Nice. Yes, so I'm working through that. I'll be writing my thesis, Lord willing, next year. Okay. But uh, that is that is where my degree is from. Uh, as we spoke earlier, I, I've been a reader my whole life. Mm -hmm. And so throughout my years as a reader, I've had a lot of good books placed in, in my way. And I remember asking my pastor as a young preacher if he would counsel me to go to Bible college or, or to Bible Institute or whatever. And he said, you know, with the way that you come to church, and he was a good teacher, he said, you're faithful to church, you read, you study for yourself. If you feel like it's necessary, maybe for the endorsement, the degree, that's up to you, but as long as you stay consistent in your study and reading, um, I, I wouldn't even say it's a necessity. Right. So that's that's kind of what happened for me. I, I did get an associate's degree at a small um, Bible college, but I didn't feel the need to pursue that anymore. So with your learning in apologetics, <clears throat> surely you have used it in dealing with, with folks. Mm -hmm. And so... What are some stories you can share just uh, that stand out to you dealing with skeptics? So this wasn't a strong night of me using the apologetics, but it's worth mentioning. Okay. Um, we used to go downtown Asheville every Saturday night. We did that for several years, and it didn't matter what the weather was like. We would go down on Saturday night. We had a route that we walked. It was the same route every week, and we would hand out gospel tracts. And usually it wasn't about the conversation. It was just a saturation thing. Right. As many tracks as we could get out as quickly as possible. And I mean, we would walk up there, each of us carrying stacks like this, mm -hmm. and be empty-handed by the end of the night. Wow. So, honestly, that's really where the bulk of my apologetics training came from. Okay. Because you run into everybody in, in Asheville. Right. I mean, you got your run of the mill atheists, your agnostics, your Buddhists, your your Catholics, and everything you can imagine is in Asheville. Mm -hmm. And so, one night we're in downtown Asheville, and they had set up the atheists and agnostics in the city put up this debate tent, and they had quotes from different thinkers throughout history. And so, I just felt drawn. Yeah. I get under there, and the conversation has already shifted to, is there a God? And that's what everybody's discussing. Usually we just took the men, because it could be a pretty rough place mm -hmm. downtown. But for whatever particular reason, there was uh, some men who had brought their wives along with them. And I remember the way this thing was operating, you took your seat, and if you were sat down, you were expected to say something when it came to you. Mm -hmm. And it would rotate around the tent like this. You'd speak your piece to the next guy, and that way everybody kind of got a turn. And one guy said, how do we know that a giant bull didn't create the universe? <laughs> and it gets to this young lady. She is just crying her eyes out at this point. You know, I'm sure never seen anything like this. Yeah. I mean, that level of hatred towards God was off the charts wow. in, in a yeah. very spiritual sense. Yeah. But it gets to her and her response to how we know a bull didn't create the universe is because a bull doesn't have hands. And she just <laughs> ran off into the night crying. I, I felt so bad for her. But uh, the apologetics that I studied, the, the strongest piece that I took away from ICR is their method of apologetics is not talking about whale bones in the Sahara Desert, which we could, mm -hmm. that exists. Seashells on the top of Mount Everest, yeah. that's real. We yeah. can talk about that. Yeah. But the style of apologetics that I walked away is called worldview apologetics. Mm -hmm. So we're not directly, uh, we're, we're not attacking the symptoms. We're attacking the source of the problem, and the source of the problem is the worldview. Right. And the only worldview that stays consistent within itself is the Christian worldview. Amen. So that's the whole perspective of apologetics. So, for example, if we're talking about an atheistic worldview, it blows itself up when especially you move into areas of morality. Hmm. 
because an atheistic worldview does not have a demand for morality. Right. As a matter of fact, it has to borrow from a Christian worldview to bridge that gap to have a functioning society. Yeah. So you see what I mean, how it blows right. itself up, right. whereas the Christian worldview remains entirely consistent from beginning to end. How do you deal with it when they bring up when they bring up, you know, what about evil in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? How do you approach that argument? That's a very one of the most, probably the most common one. It's extremely common. <clears throat> um, one of the most well-known agnostics in America teaches in my home state, teaches New Testament at the University of North Carolina. His name's Bart Ehrman. Mm -hmm. And Bart Ehrman attributes his quote-unquote deconversion to that thought. If there is an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God, how could he allow the evils to come into the world that he does? And the answer is so simple. And I don't mean to oversimplify it, but it is simple. God makes it clear to us that evil is present in the world because man introduced it. Amen. Death came upon all men because yep. man sinned. Right. And so all the evils that we experience, whether it's the classic events they try and bring up, tornadoes, hurricanes, childhood cancers, all trace back to man introducing sin into the world mm -hmm. and death passing upon all men. Right. So when when we're dealing with somebody, here's one thing that people have to remember in poly, apologetics. They get so hung up on the argument, most people when they first move into this, they get so hung up on the philosophical arguments and trying to win the argument. Mm -hmm. Apologetics isn't about winning an argument, at least proper biblical-based apologetics. As a matter of fact, where apologetics begins when we're referencing the writings of Peter, first you sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Right. And that's where you start. It's about giving glory to God. And then you're ready to give an answer to those who ask of the hope that's within you. But apologetics many times gets pushed off to this idea of I've got to win an argument. Mm. We had conversations this week about people who were in difficult spots doing arguments or debates, if you will, mm. um, and, and struggled as they were doing those particular discussions and, and debates. That doesn't negate the truth. Right. So winning the argument isn't whether something's true or not. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people put that that whole entity in their court that if I if I win this argument, it's going to prove that mm -hmm. this is true. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's true because it's true because right. of the nature of the thing. Right. I could lose every argument uh, on <clears throat> on the gospel from now till doomsday and the gospel still be pertinent for salvation. Amen. So that's where we have to start that we're first doing this to honor and glorify God, but to the best of our ability, creating good answers sure. for those who would ask of us. Right. So I know you, you like to study history and you know how <clears throat> the fundamentalist movement came about was this was uh, the way that churches were trying to combat the apostasy that modernists were bringing into the churches because there was a strong desire for Christians to try to reconcile science mm -hmm. with the Bible. So uh, how much with you, th that this is your subject that you like to study, apologetics, how much should science be reconciled with the Bible or should it not be reconciled at all? How do you approach that attempt of people trying to reconcile science with the Bible? I'll start off with a quote from my pastor from last Sunday morning. He was preaching somewhat along these lines, and he said, quote, he doesn't care if they unearth a whole family of cavemen sitting at a dinner table and say they're a billion <laughs> years old. Yeah. It won't change his perspective one iota. Right. And I'm I'm in that same camp. Um, throughout history, there were certain tumultuous points where specifically when evolution was becoming a real stronghold um, as it was being propagated, this idea of not needing a creator 
um, that all things just came about of their own. Um, there was confusion and concern within Christianity to try to to create means to justify that. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there's things like the um, the long day theory that mm -hmm. these aren't actual days in, in Genesis one and two, that they're actually gigantic periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, I, I have to say this real quietly, <laughs> the gap theory, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that yeah. uh, there's some evidence that it may have been a thing before this time period mm -hmm. uh, in the 1800s as this is becoming a reality. But really, it had a prime stronghold then because Christians felt it was necessary to have some means to create these long ages. Mm -hmm. to combat um, evolution. And, and so what I would say, me personally, is there are things that we can't explain. Mm -hmm. There are things we don't understand. Um, one of the things that Christianity on the science plane struggles with explaining is starlight. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's so distant, if light travels um, X amount of speed you know, speed of light, then it should take millions, if not billions of years for that light to reach us. Mm -hmm. And yet we can see it. Yeah. And so there's arguments, we call them rescue devices. Um, there's arguments for why we can see that distant starlight. One of which is that God created things with the appearance of age and he created those stars for a purpose ultimately Psalm 19 to bring glory to him Amen. that we can look up and say, Hey, there has to be somebody who did this. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Amen. But the same thing's true on the other side. So for example, comets, if the universe were billions of years old, there should be no comets in the universe. And so what they have done on the evolution side is they've created what's called the Oort cloud. Jan Oort devised this theory, and the Oort cloud is what produces comets. Now, nobody's ever seen an Oort cloud. Nobody's ever felt one. Nobody's ever observed one. It's total theory and speculation, but it's because there are comets, so there must be something producing these comets. So do you see the, the yeah. issue? Yeah. Regardless of which side you're on, there's always going to be something you can't explain. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is we're all pulling from the same pile of evidence. If I have this big pile of dinosaur bones and I am a creationist, I'm going to pick this up and say that, you know, this is no more than 6,000 years old and God created it on day six, this, this being, this animal. Whereas the evolutionist is going to pick up that same bone and say, this bone is 65 million years old and we're going to date it with all of our methods and techniques to prove that it's 65 million years old. It, it's the same pile of evidence. Mm -hmm. Again, just backtracking a little bit, that's why we go to the, the worldview. Because worldview steps outside of this pile of bones that we're looking at and actually deals with the lenses that we're looking at it right, with. Right. So how far do I feel like I need to go with science? I, I don't feel like it's necessary to go out of my way at all. As a matter of fact, biblically, and that's where all of our arguments begin, right. we have the understanding that God cautions us about science falsely Philosophy. called yep. and vain philosophies. Right. So we have a biblical warning to be aware of those things. So that's right. that's where we start as believers. And uh, you spoke to this earlier, but uh, I like I like where you're going with when you say that you take them all the way to their core, their their worldview. When you can, when you argue things from that plane, you can take them to the gospel. Yes. And at the end of the day. Sometimes we can get so wrapped up into the arguments and all the details that we fail to realize that really we need to just get down to the basics where the power of God is going to manifest itself is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So there are some Christians, and, and what they call this is evidentialism. And that's what I was saying like about the dinosaur bones and all that. Mm -hmm. it, it's that we're going to get as much evidence as we can. Sure. And whoever has the biggest pile of evidence wins. It doesn't work like that, mm -hmm. okay? And, and that is unfortunately where a lot of people, especially those outside the Bible-believing group, come from, that mm -hmm. we just got to have the biggest pile of evidence in order to win this argument. Mm -hmm. um, the evidence can be swayed either direction because of how that, how that we're looking through our particular lenses at this thing. So it, it's not about the the pile of evidence that I can have to try and persuade somebody. I'm trying to get back there. There was a train of thought I had and, and it got derailed <laughs> somewhere in here. Um, but it was about, you'd mention, oh yeah, getting to the gospel. Right. So a, a lot of Christians, especially when they're just enamored with the idea of apologetics and winning an argument, it's about that big pile of evidence. Mm -hmm. And they'll say things like, well, you can't argue with them from the Bible because they don't believe the Bible, so we use this evidence. Mm -hmm. My evidence isn't the power of God. Mm -hmm. The gospel is the power of God. Right. So if I'm dealing with a lost man, yeah, he can say all day that he doesn't believe the Bible, but according to Romans 1, 2, and 3, in his heart of hearts, when he stands before the great white throne judgment, he's not going to say, I wonder how I got here. He's going to say, I've been expecting this. Hmm. Because the Bible says that God has revealed himself to those individuals. Amen. So, yes, use the scriptures. Don't, don't ever leave that out for the sake of evidence. Right. I like the evidence, but that can't be all there is to it. Amen. What are some of your hobbies? Oh man, I got more hobbies than I can count. Um, I, I like kayaking, I fish, um, hunt. I'm a ham radio operator. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I uh, got my ham radio license. Um, I like video games. I like board games. Yeah. I literally have more hobbies than I can count, and uh, trying to maintain them all—that's yeah—that's the hard part. <laughs> Amen. And finally, you have a podcast. Yes. Tell us about that. So we call the podcast Unmovable, and it's based in my love of apologetics and people who were just strong Christians. We're doing a series right now called uh, Men of Unmovable Faith. Okay. And last week and this coming week, a friend of mine, Caleb Hickam, he's very great in Baptist history. He's our guest on the podcast and we're talking about some Anabaptist men who suffered and died for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And coming up in the next couple of weeks, my daughter and I usually do it together. She's going to be talking about, um, I wish I could remember exactly who it was, but it, it's going to be a lady. Oh, John Bunyan's wife. Okay. John Bunyan's wife was very strong. A lot of people focus on Bunyan. He spent... 12 years in prison because he wouldn't take a license from right. the the government right. in order to preach. And Elizabeth Bunyan was arguing on his behalf in the courts. Mm -hmm. And so it was amazing the, the faith and the fortitude she had standing for her husband and also standing for the gospel. Yeah. There's a, a quote that can be attributed to her. It's from one of the books called This Day in Baptist History. But... They told her, if your husband will just quit preaching, if he'll just promise to stop preaching today, we'll, we'll let him go. Mm -hmm. And she held out her apron and said, I'd rather carry his head out in my apron than for him to quit preaching the gospel. Wow. I mean, that's unmovable. Yes, so, it is. So uh, we'll be talking about her. And then wow. my wife's going to join to talk about um, Adoniram Judson's wife. Amen. A yeah, so talking about some of the ladies who had strong influence um, particularly in Baptist history. Yeah. And so uh, we do that, but we also talk about some of the topics like you and I have talked about. We, we've talked about, um, we got one called Proof uh, that the Bible is the Word of God. And I would say that particular one I've got the most feedback on. Nice. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, Brother Randy. I, we've enjoyed having you here in these days with us. I appreciate that.
and uh, look forward to having you back. Yeah, it's been good. And uh, you and your family are a blessing. And if any of you guys are looking for a good evangelist that'll, that can come by and be an edification to your church, Brother Randy's a good one. Uh, check out his podcast. God bless you guys. 